Welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series, your resource for the latest news and updates on pressing issues facing the accounting profession. Good afternoon and welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series. I'm Eric Auskerson, one of your hosts for today. And as you see, I'm here with Mark Peterson, the lead of the AICP Advocacy Group. It's, it's great. Nice, nice to be here in New York with you, Eric. It's great to be in person. Mark's been busy traveling the country. It's a busy time, as you all know, for, for what's going on in the nation's capital with these elections coming up. So we've got a great town hall in store for you. It's going to be multi-part. We're going to kick things off with a leadership discussion with Simon Bailey. Simon Bailey is a leadership, he's been a leadership coach for over 2,000 companies, and he's going to bring us some practical insights on how to uh, lead like a C CEO and act like an employee. So we'll be getting into that shortly. Then with Mark, I'm going to be talking about some things that are going on at the IRS. We've got a new acting IRS commissioner. We've got the elections less than a week away. So a lot to discuss there. We're then going to have an extended technical update section where we will talk about the IRS draft schedules for the K2 and K3s. We're going to talk about the ERC mill issue. I've already seen some questions coming in related to that item. And we're also going to give you an update on the Government Audit Quality Center and talk about uh, the first uh, update related to the independence guidance from the DOL on employee benefit plans uh, for the past in, in the past 30 years. So an interesting development there. And then we'll close with open form and closing remarks. So here's the lineup of presenters. We're going to kick things off with Simon Bailey. So let me welcome uh, Simon. How are you? Simon, it's great to have you. So let me just uh, provide our audience a little bit of additional background on you. Uh, Simon, you know, many years back, was an executive at Disney. He's somebody who's focused on how to really you know, bring out your brilliance, as, as you can see some of the the titles of these books that he's authored. He's going to be speaking at Digital CPA in December. We put a lot of thought into the keynotes at Digital CPA. It's a very important element of the conference. And Simon will be our closing speaker. And I actually already, Simon, announced the, the, the title of, of your talk, which will be to think like a CP, CEO and act like an employee um, I'm really looking forward to having you at that event. I'm looking forward to today's discussion. So, Simon, let's just kick things off. You know, we're we're in a very uncertain environment. Um, every week, it seems like you know our firms have to overcome unknown issues. There could be unknown issues related to guidance with the IRS. Uh, there's uncertainty on where the economy is going. So let's just let's just kick it off uh, with that. And if you want to share a little bit more about yourself, uh, I'd welcome that as well. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to join you. Uh, hello to everyone. I live in Orlando, Florida. Uh, my wife and I have four children from 20 to 27. And I left Disney about 20 years ago. So I've been a solopreneur for 20 years and have reinvented five times. <laughs> and let me just say, I love my CPAs. <laughs> they have really uh, bailed me out and uh, helped me in a pinch. Uh, I think one of the things we have to understand Every person listening has to embrace the mindset that I call adaptive resilience. Mm -hmm. Adaptive resilience is overcoming the unexpected. And when you overcome the unexpected, I've got three strategies that I want to invite you to think about. And the first one uh, is really <laughs> based on my conversation with one of my CPAs, Marcy. So I went through a divorce after being married for 25 years and in uh, the, as the divorce was happening, I got diagnosed with cancer. Uh, I beat it, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. And I had a significant uh, tax issue with the IRS. So I'm talking to Marcy and I am absolutely like freaking out. And Marcy's like, just calm down. I have a friend at the IRS that I know and I'm working with another client who has the same type of issue. Let me use my 30 years of relationships with the IRS to see if I can make a call and we can figure this out. And sure enough, she did. And I said, Marcy, I teach this stuff, but you were so calm. 
And so that first strategy is calm commotion because it's something that I've learned over the years and something that I teach uh, a lot of audiences and, and certainly when I do executive coaching. So you're probably saying, Simon, what's calm commotion? Calm commotion is to take a moment, you take a deep breath, and you begin to reflect on what has made you successful thus far. Now, you're probably saying, ah, oh, Simon, that's like soft. Does that really work? It absolutely works because when you think about what's made you successful and significant, what you're doing, you're shifting states. So if you ever have those moments when you're just like, whoa, what's going on? Just come back to the center and experience calm commotion by reliving when you have been successful in time past. Attach a feeling or emotion to it. And then as you come out of that, perhaps write some things down. Okay. That's the first one. Second one is if you ever have days when everybody wants a piece of you, take out a sheet of paper, set your time to 30 seconds and write down everything that is right about you. And you're probably saying why? Because when you write down what's right about you, you once again are taking control of the steering wheel of the future and looking through the windshield of where you're going instead of the rear view mirror of where you've been. All right. And then the third strategy to think about comes from a conversation that I had with Harry Kramer. Harry Kramer is the former chairman and CEO of Baxter Healthcare. And I said to Harry, I said, Harry, chairman and CEO, 40 year career. How do you really implement adaptive resilience in the midst of uncertainty? And he said, Simon, every leader needs to understand how to self reflect. And Eric, I said to him, I said, self-reflect, unpack that for me. He said, for the last 40 years, he asked himself three questions before his head hits the pillow every evening. Question number one, what did I learn today? Question number two, what difference did I make today? And question number three, what am I going to do better tomorrow? Well, I mean, Simon, that's, I, I like how you just kind of boiled some good practical advice uh, down related to just really adapting. And then you think about in today's world, adaption is so critical. But even just this discussion about leadership, when I think about the digital CPA community, they're thinking about the capabilities that they're putting in place. They're thinking about their business strategies, but they also really do believe in this you know, leadership element, self-awareness, self-reflection, the things that you're talking about, I'm actually a big believer in it. Uh, I've, I've been leveraging an executive coach for, for many, many years. So this is important. This is important. This When I, we were at council last week, we were talking about all the challenges. We're talking about the talent issue. And we had a great panel discussion. And one of the things that we talked about in that panel discussion was on you know, leadership and strategies and how that helps address the talent issue in your firm by just building building a better culture. So one other thing that you and I spoke about um, uh, earlier this week was just, you know, focus on clients and client care. Uh, so maybe share some of your, your insights related to that. So right now I'm inviting organizations to shift from client care to human care. Why? The research according to Gallup as they have looked at almost 191 countries over the last year, they are saying that roughly seven out of 10 people in the workplace, doesn't matter what industry or business, are stressed out dealing with high anxiety and borderline depression. So this ability to move from client care to human care is to start with a simple question whenever you're dealing with your clients. And that question is, how are you? And I know most of everyone on this call probably starts with small talk because you've had deep relationships for a long time. But the reason I double click and drop a pen in the how are you, because you may be the first person that took a moment to check in on them. So the how are you question. The second thing is, what is it that you know about them? Uh, and when I say specifically know about them, is there a personal factoid that you know about them that you can use? You may know the name of the spouse or their grandchild or uh, their, any of their employees. Taking that human moment to say, how are they doing? What's going on? Once again, and, and hear what I'm about to say, mm -hmm. your words become healing presence for them because they're like, wait a minute, you're concerned about me. So what's the net net takeaway? 
how do we move from me to we? And it's in the we-ness of human service where we're really asking that question. And then as it relates to the business, uh, which certainly is what brings you together, hearing them and really understanding where they are. So how do we begin to listen to understand instead of listening to respond? And, and so Leanne's one of the other CPAs that I've worked with for a little bit. And Leanne has this uncanny knack to ask me the question that I didn't see coming that causes me to stop and say, whoa, that's a really great question. So how do we move from client service to human service and whatever that looks like for you? Well, let me, that's, that's some, uh, it, it, again, more good insights. I got some, you know, questions coming in. Somebody actually wants a, a transcript from today's discussion. And we absolutely, you can get the transcript uh, with the archive version of the town hall. Let me just, you know, dig in a little bit more to the client question. Because what is happening at times is the clients can come with, with some pretty, you know, extreme demands. They can get materials uh, tax information to to the firm late, and potentially uh, the partner could say, "Yeah, we'll just we'll just get it done." And there's a lot of pressure on the staff to get this work done and to meet those client expectations. So it's great to talk about client care, but how do you manage these situations where you're being put in a situation where to solve the client's need, you're going to impact the quality of life of one of your employees? Well, first of all, I think it starts with that conversation with the client. Every client has a compass. And if we're going to point them the true north, we have to understand their need, their want, their style, and their emotion. And how do we start with understanding, hey, we just got the information that you sent to us. We want to manage expectation so that we will deliver it by this time. In order to do that, uh, we are going to follow the following steps. And the reason I say just double clicking on communication, because absence of uh, the narrative, people fill in the blank. So if we're going to make sure that talent doesn't leave us and, you know, like, wait a minute, why are you giving me more work? Let's over communicate intentionally. I think the third thing or the second thing is to really let talent know and individuals who have to do that work, let's manage it accordingly and let's set milestones when we will check in to make sure everything's okay, right? And then the third thing is once it is delivered, ensure that that staff member, that team member, that we tell them thank you, muchas gracias, danke schön. We appreciate you going above and beyond on behalf of this client. Well, you know, just to kind of close out our segment here, Simon, as you think about your relationship uh, with your CPAs, and I, I, I did appreciate how you described to me when you had some more complex situations, you realized you needed to upgrade uh, your service uh, to, to a CPA firm, and things really turned out uh, very well for you from, a, from a, a value and advice standpoint. When you think about your relationship uh, with your firm, and you think about, you know, what you know, we're discussing here in this town hall, what, what type of leadership advice would you provide them? Number one, see every client as a relationship instead of a transaction. So what do I mean? Specifically, when it comes to tax time, and obviously there are things that happen quarterly, uh, but to give and, and reach out to them, and it's that just because call, just checking in, right? How are you doing? And it can even be a text, goes a long way. That's like an emotional deposit into the emotional bank account, right? I think the second thing to really uh, be intentional about is having that hard conversation because you are like their financial quarterback when it comes to their business. And I look at my CPAs as, as my financial quarterbacks, like what are the plays, what are we doing? And I trust them because it is not my swim lane. So building that trust to, to have the hard conversation with me and say, Simon, we're not doing this. And here's why we're not doing it. And even though I'm an alpha, you know, and, and I want to have my way and I'm always right. I'm like, OK, all right. I'll cry, uncle. You're right. We're going to go with it. And I think the third thing is I don't mind referral uh, and, and giving reviews and recommendations. And, and, and I think that only happens when you do really, really good work. And I'll even pay extra. So charge me for it. Like, so I have another CPA that I'm going to be working with and his price is double 
what another CPA that I've been paying, and I'm paying for it because he's a tax strategist and he has some insight and some things that I've been wanting. So you don't get what you ask for, you get what you negotiate. And he came in hard and he says, this is my price. And I'm like, dude, your name is the profit coach and you're a CPA. Absolutely, I'm gonna work with you and I'm gonna pay your price. Well, hey, Simon, thanks for today's discussions. I love, you know, we, we did talk about the evolution of services that you were getting from your firm. You're a great example. I mean, you're, you're a leadership coach for 2,000 companies, and you're seeing this tremendous value in working more strategically with firms. One other area that uh, Simon's looking at is outsourcing of accounting services to firms. That's not why we brought them to Digital CPA. We brought them to Digital CPA for these leadership insights, which are really important. We're going to get now into the Washington, D.C. updates. We're going to talk about the technical updates, but this is an important element of the town hall. So, Simon, thank you. Uh, we will get your this transcript out to those who want to see it uh, and, and, and read it again and look forward to having you in Austin in uh, December. Thank you. So with that, uh, Mark, uh, we're going to pivot. You know, uh, one thing Simon talks about is discovering your brilliance. I mean, I'm not sure if that's you know, discussed too much in D.C., but what we're going to do is we're going to kick things off. We're going to get into the elections. Uh, but this is some pretty big news related to, you know, what's happened with the IRS, the, the, the new acting uh, Commissioner O'Donnell. And actually, he was, he was with, at an AICPA event yesterday. Yeah, he's great. He's great. So thank you, Eric. I tell you what, um, I don't think that, that we've had a town hall where we haven't talked about IRS service. And there is, there is some news coming out. Uh, they did announce late October that they um, are going to be hiring 4,000 new customer service representatives. Uh, good news. They got to get them. They got to get them. They got to get them onboarded. They've got to get them trained in all kinds of things. But the sooner they have them, the sooner they're going to be helping practitioners and taxpayers. And then there's also been a commitment to also get 1,000 more between now and the end of the year. Uh, originally, it was 5,000 by February. And so the fact that they are front loading this is good for us as we go into what is going to be another challenging tax season. And we know that, um, you know, the, there's going to be a lot of focus on service. We talked to, at, at the last town hall meeting about kind of the, the, polit the politics around all of the funding that went into enforcement at the IRS, the 87,000 new um, IRS enforcement agents. But that is also going to create an opportunity for us to talk about service, and we're going to continue to do that. Commissioner Reddick's term is up, uh, and what they've done is they reached into the IRS, and uh, they've named Doug O'Donnell as the acting commissioner. 37-year uh, career uh, IRS employee, senior staff. Uh, he's been responsible for uh, enforcement and service. Um, we, we, are, we work a lot. We work weekly with the IRS and he's an individual that we've worked with a lot and we're going to enjoy working with him again. Um, and we are also, also are going to look for opportunities to help the IRS and, and the acting commissioner when we can. Like I said, there's going to be a lot of focus on the, on the 87,000 agents. Uh, there's going to be a lot of discussion about resources and we want to be in the mix with our recommendations, trying to influence the outcome and getting that service that we need. Uh, little on acting. So basically, um, with an, when an agency's head term ends, they, there's a confirmation process in the Senate in order to name the new one they have to go through. So in the meantime, they can name an acting commissioner, an acting chair, depending on the, on the agency. So basically, that helps to gap, make sure there's leadership there until they can get through confirmation. This is going to be Confirmation of a new candidate to be the commissioner of the IRS is going to is election dependent. To be honest, depending on what happens with the Senate, uh, the the Biden administration will have to get a candidate through the Senate confirmation process. So that's going to play out. We'll see. I think that there's a decent possibility because a lot of the controversy around the IRS uh, that it, he Doug could be acting commissioner for quite a while. Well, Mark, let's kind of you know, keep keep things going and talk about before we get into the elections, just, you know, what what is the likelihood of a year end deal? Well, and so the year end deal is alive. It's alive. The, the only thing they absolutely have to do, Eric, is fund the government. They kick mm -hmm. the can over until December 13th. So the only thing they absolutely have to do when they come back post election is get the government funded. Uh, having said that, it's the last train out of the station at the end of the year. Um, they're, have, historically, they're very ambitious about the plans for that. 
Uh, usually it boils down to the must pass things and then maybe a handful of other things. We're watching it very closely. We're going to reassess after the election. But I just wanted to point out, you know, you could see the deal coming together. This is actually I'm noting a letter that came in from a group of moderate House Democrats to the House Democrat leadership, 51 uh, signatories that are very focused on the child tax credit. But they want to couple it with a couple other things, including the R&D fix, which is one that, that, you know, we've been focused on as well. And I know that there's a lot of interest in that from the town hall community and tax practitioners. The goal here is to really put pressure on the leadership to get a deal, but to also attach some of these very needed issues like the, the expiring tax provisions to this last, last train out of the station bill that we're going to see come together post-election. Well, Mark, I have to say, I don't, the press is not paying too much attention right now to a year-end deal. Uh, right. With the midterm elections next week, we also had the big announcement you know, from the Fed yesterday on you know, the, the, the 73 quarter point uh, rate increase. And then it, uh, at first it looked like some good news when they said December might be only a half a point. But then as Powell continued to talk, uh, the markets kind of interpreted some of those uh, comments as, you know, this the, the rates could go higher than originally uh, expected. But he, and that's in that's in going into clearly the elections. You you gave us a great recap um, a few weeks back. So where do things stand well, now? Since then, so let me j- just if you recall, Eric, one of the I laid out a couple of data historic data points uh, that happened during midterms. Again, I'm going to remind you at the beginning and end of this, we're a bipartisan program and yep. we're going to work with whoever's in charge. Um, but just a couple data points based on historic midterms since World War II. So it doesn't matter. Republicans and Democrats, the party in the White House has historically lost in the midterms an average of 26 seats. Mm-hmm. If the president's uh, below or below 50 percent, it's been of, of approval rating. It's been, you know, 32 seats. Uh Today, President Biden is at at about 41 Mm -hmm. percent approval in a lot of the polls. So when you put that together with when you look at the toss up seats, which are, you know, they're not hard red and they're not hard blue. But the ones that are really in play, which is about 36, maybe even more that is growing, which is not good for the Democrat majority because more of them in the toss up category are are um, are blue or Democrat seats means they've got to defend. Mm -hmm. So they've got a bigger field to defend. So if you put that all together, again, the likelihood is that the House is going to flip. I think the question and what people are going to be watching closely is what's the size of that margin? Mm-hmm. And that will make a big difference with uh, the population on the on the committee assignments. What's mm-hmm. the size of that majority? Uh, would, will the Republican House leadership, what kind of what ability will they have to move legislation through the House? Um, and then you look at the Senate. Senate is much closer. But again, even since we talked last week. Uh, for the we I follow Real Clear Politics, which is an a um, aggregation of a bunch of different polls. Mm-hmm. Polls are what they are; they're directional. Right. Um, but but in those in both in um, Pennsylvania and in Georgia, which are are two of the states that are being tracked very closely, the Republicans have actually for the first time uh, gone past the the uh, Democrat candidates by a point. So we're watching. New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Nevada, Wisconsin, Georgia. Georgia is that uh, runoff state. So if it's close, and it could be, uh, we may not actually know the outcome of that until the middle of December. So that's one thing. It, it's, you're not going to know everything next Tuesday night. Probably not. Not just Georgia. Other other outcomes that might be later in the month. You know, it, it, recounts. You know, in Pennsylvania, you've got all the the mail-in votes, which they don't start counting right. till that day. It always takes a while. And, and if they're close, in some states, a, a recount is required. Mm-hmm. So it just depends on the state. It depends on how close it is. It depends on, you know, if the incumbent or the challenger will concede or not. So there are a lot of factors that are going into it. Again, regardless of the outcome, we're going to be prepared for new agendas and we're going to hit the ground running. We're going to have a lot of new people to meet. Well, let's let's talk about, you know, as you move, it will be the 118th Congress. It is. It is. <laughs> That's where we are. It is. That's where we are. So this is this is what will happen in this right now fo- forecasted divided government. Well, if, if assuming that that the way it plays out is is what what I've described, and I think there's a good chance it's it's likely actually that the House is going to flip. We'll see what happens with the Senate. Um, divided government, which means that even though you have the ability in Congress to potentially pass stuff, 
it still has to be signed by the president. That's how it's designed. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the president isn't going to pass a lot of things that, that a House Republican majority is going to pass, although there will be things that, that they can work on in a bipartisan way. We mm -hmm. work in a bipartisan way. And a lot of our initiatives uh, have been very successful bipartisan. We've got several that we're, we're retooling mm -hmm. uh, to get reintroduced, to figure out ways to gather support for them. Uh, just just a, a few to highlight. There's a, a piece of lot thought leadership, Eric, that's really focused on fiscal responsibility. Um, we stay out of the politics of raise taxes, lower taxes, you know, raise spending, cut spending. Uh, that's obviously very partisan and the policymakers can decide that. But what we're focused on and where we have a lot of credibility is on transparency. Uh, and we have an initiative that would actually legislatively require a joint session, basically a joint session of Congress of the two budget committees to come together and have the Comptroller General take a look at the financial statements. Mm -hmm. So you're going to pass your policies, whatever they may be, but to actually review the financial statements to see. I think as we kind of move out of a lot of the uh, spending that we did during COVID in order to get the economy going, um, people are debt and deficit discussions are coming back. We're also very, very focused on uh, getting accounting into STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. That's a pipeline play. Uh, there's a lot of benefit for being designated in, a, in one of the STEM disciplines. And it will also help, it'll help us in the, in the high schools. It's gonna help us in the colleges. Uh, and it's something that we're really focused on. It's just kind of working it through the process. Mobile workforce is one we were talking about before COVID. Uh, and basically what that is, is with the patchwork of state income tax, it is a de minimis standard of 30 days that would be across uh, the country. There are a couple issues that we're trying to out iron out in, in a handful of states, we, bipartisan. We've actually got it out of house in the past. We're gonna, we're gonna definitely reboot that and we'll be talking about it. And then we started with IRS service. We're not taking IRS off the ball. There's going to be a lot of opportunity, as I mentioned, because of the oversight hearings up mm. with the IRS. There's going to, to a certain extent, there'll be a reboot of the relationship because they're going to have a new acting commissioner. Um, and then we're going to focus on working with the IRS, but we're going to focus on some of the things that we think that would be helpful, revitalizing um, the IRS oversight board, which has kind of fallen by the wayside. We, we have for a long time really pushed the idea of creating an IRS practitioner section to take are more sophisticated questions out of line. So normal taxpayers can get those answers, but practitioners have, who have different questions can get them answered. And then there's an exponential effect because we're dealing with multiple clients and also working on some things that could potentially provide some relief. They, these are, have been really, really tough tax seasons. And there are some things related to penalty relief, uh, some things related to making it easier to extend that we're, we're, we're going to focus on as well. Well, Mark, I mean, I think that's one of the key points that you always make is kind of how you work in a bipartisan fashion. I remember we when we started these town halls two years ago, you're working with the Republican administration. Yep. And all kinds of probably some of the highest level of dialogue that you've ever had due to what was happening in America with the firms and business relief. In the last two years, we've been working uh, with this administration, with absolutely with, with the, the current setup of the Senate and, and, and the House, and now, you know, things always change. They so do. it's like, but the thing, what, what you're trying to do, and I think that's so important. You, we have a lot of questions coming in and comments, but just really staying laser focused on the on the key issues for the firms and in the profession. And there's going to be a lot of education because even if the seat didn't flip from one right. party to the other, there were a lot of retirements, and so we're going to have you know 150, maybe more brand new members of Congress, we're going to have to re-educate on these issues. So there's a lot of work to be done at, at the beginning of any new Congress. We're going to get in there. We're going to do the work. We come from a great, great base because we, we have the credibility of the profession, which is in every congressional district, which is in all across the, the uh, business community, large and small. We have a ton of credibility and we've got, you know, that's in Republican districts and Democrat districts. So it's a phenomenal platform. Well, great, Mark. Uh, we're going to bring this segment to a close. We'll look forward to having you during the open forum. And one thing I think we will, it's great to have you here live in New York. And I think we are talking about a 2023 uh, town hall live from, from the nation's capital. So that, that'll be something that we can work on. So now let's move to the technical update uh, section. We've got a lot of great updates for you. 
uh, really related to many of the questions that you've been asking over the past town halls and kicking things off is related to the, the K2 and K3 top question items. So Carrie Hipsack, welcome. Carrie's filling in uh, for Lisa Simpson and you all know Carrie well. Thank you, Eric. Yes, as you mentioned, schedules K2 and K3 are a very hot topic for our town hall attendees. I wanted to start off by highlighting the efforts made by our AICPA advocacy team, specifically around the schedules K2 and K3. They are aware that there are lots of questions and concerns with schedules K2 and K3 and have been hard at work to advocate for the position of the profession. In general, the AICPA has recognized the burden of these schedules and has advocated for broader exceptions for these forms making permanent the 2021 tentative exemption from filing schedules K2 and K3 for certain domestic partnerships that met certain criteria, reducing the compliance burden for foreign tax credit, and working to limit the significant and relevant information that was required to be reported to take off some of that burden of reporting all this detail that maybe wasn't necessary. And finally, the advocacy team has been making a case for de minimis rules for certain information requirements to, again, lessen the burden of, require, of reporting those details by these schedules. Uh, Eric, as you are well aware, the advocacy team does a lot more. Schedules K2 and K3 are, are simply the tip of the iceberg. And the greatest part of their work is seeing some of the results that come about from their work. So about a week ago, the IRS did release release draft form 1065 instructions, which include schedules K2 and K3 instructions for 2022 returns. There are a number of clarifications, updates, um, uh, little tidbits of information, if you will. There is about a page and a half of fairly fine print with updates to keep in mind. We're not getting into all of those details, but I did want to point out the new filing exception that builds on FAQ 15. As a reminder, FAQ 15 provided transitional relief for the 2021 tax year only and provided an exception from filing schedules K2 and K3 for certain pass-through entities that again met spe specific conditions. Included with this new filing exception, there are examples to help with the application of, of this exception. So the instructions also go into the details of the domestic filing exceptions and what partnerships need to have in order to qualify. The first two are fairly straightforward. The first is that there is no or limited foreign activity. The second is that there are U.S. citizen or resident alien partners. Now, assuming both of those are met, we move on to the third criteria, which is that a notification from the partnership must be sent to the partners, letting them know that they will not receive schedules, the schedule K3, excuse me, from the partnership unless the partners request that schedule. The partner, the partnership, I should say, uh, they have they can go ahead and mail that electronically or you know good old-fashioned postal mail and that has to be dated no later than two months before the due date due date for filing the partnerships tax year 2022 form 1065 and i do want to point out that that is the, the static due date this does not include extensions the fourth criteria refers to the no one month date request the one month date is one month before the due date, again, without extension of the partnerships form 1065. So for example, tax year 2022 calendar year partnerships, that one month date would be February 15th, 2023. And this is saying that the partnership does not receive a request from any partner for that schedule K3 information on or before that one month date. So these, these schedules and developments are really just a piece of the pie. We've received numerous yeah. questions. Yeah, Kara, I was just gonna say a lot of questions coming in. I don't think you can address them all, but you, we've got a, a, a whole list of resources available. 
Yes, absolutely. We know that there are still a lot more questions. This is from the draft form 1065. So again, we have draft information for the schedules K2 and K3, but we expect more news to come. And we have this website that you can access at the link below that has podcasts regarding K2 and K3, um, some other resources, and it also links out to the AIC, AIC Pay Advocacy News. So you can see there all that the AIC Pay Advocacy team has done. And there are also direct links to IRS guidance as well. Karen, what I want to tell the, the town hall audience is that I, we appreciate all these questions that have come in, probably about 30 questions related to uh, what you just covered, and we'll leverage those questions and we'll continue to follow up uh, in future town halls on them and also make sure we're updating our resources to uh, answer them as best as possible. So now another hot topic, and we even labeled this ERC Mills. So it is causing a lot of frustration for firms. So last town hall, we gave uh, that little toolkit about the myths uh, and facts related to what's going on with ER the ERCs. Uh, and I know that I've heard from a lot of firms that that has been a very useful tool. So here's some more information. Yes, we get a lot of questions specifically about ERC mills, which are those organizations that are taking at best aggressive positions in regards to filing ERC for, uh, for organizations that these mills might think qualify for ERC. It has been a hot topic amongst town hall attendees, both in the Q&A live on town halls and subsequently our teams at the AICPA have been getting a number of questions about them. So the IRS did release this new process for anonymously reporting ERC mills. The form 3949A can be used to go ahead and file again anonymously some information about those entities that you've, you may feel are again taking at best aggressive positions when it comes to ERC. And I think during open forum, Carrie, I'll have Mark comment on, on this matter as well, because his team has been very, very active uh, talking to some of the leadership there on the Hill, as well as at the uh, IRS about this matter. Yes. Thanks so much, Eric, for joining us for those, those top town hall topics. I'd like to digress a little bit from IRS updates and move into small firm updates. Small firms are very important, of course, to the profession and the AICPA, and I wanted to highlight a few of the small firm-specific resources that we have available. We are just a few days into November, and you may or may not know that October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, so a lot of our most recent, most recent resources are from October, and they happen to cover cybersecurity topics. So while we are outside of the official Cybersecurity Awareness Month, it is never a bad time to consider cybersecurity for your firm, no matter how big or small. The first small firm resource I would like to highlight is the Small Firm Philosophy Podcast. This is a podcast dedicated to all things small firms. The topics vary from cybersecurity, as you can see here, this is the latest podcast to mergers and acquisitions. We've done an ANA in small firm podcast and um, also diversity in small firms as well. So there are there is a wide variety of topics in here. If you want to click on that small firm philosophy podcast link, if you download the materials, you can scroll through all the topics and find those that might pertain to your firm. Additionally, we do produce small firm articles from Carl Peterson. Some of you may recognize Carl from the town halls, as well as from being out and about and meeting your firm personally. Carl Peterson is our VP of small firm interest, and he is dedicated to, of course, small firm interest. So one thing he does is he helps to write articles for specifically small firms. And again, the most recent one is hyperlinked here, and it does relate to cyber risks. In addition to these two avenues for communicating specifically with small firms, Carl does do quarterly small firm updates. The next one is coming up December 8th, 
2022, obviously, it's this year still. And if you click on that link, you can get registered for that. And we will also have Carl back on the ASCPA Town Hall in January. So you can all look forward to hearing from of his, some of his small firm insights there as well. Uh, last but not least, I also wanted to draw attention to the Tax Section Odyssey podcast. They, again, had a cybersecurity podcast um, for Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So again, we're in November, but it's never a bad time to get up to date on cybersecurity topics. Moving on, we have a small audit update segment, which brings me back to my, my young days when I was a, a new CPA and an auditor in firms. I'm going to kick it off with some Government Audit Quality Center updates, which you will hear abbreviated as GAQC. I know we have a ton of acronyms, so I wanna make sure that I don't throw that out there without clarifying that it's for government audits. The first bullet that I wanna highlight are the resources for organizations undergoing their first single audit. A lot of organizations received government funding during the COVID-19 pandemic for the first time and maybe don't know what a single audit is. As a reminder, and maybe, um, maybe not a reminder, but maybe just for your information, if you're not familiar with single audits, a single audit is an audit that is performed on an entity that receives government funds in excess of $750,000. It is an audit that is used to help ensure that the funds are being used in accordance with the, the policy and procedure and the rules of the, the program as they were released. So again, COVID-19 was new for a lot of people and organizations were receiving federal funds for the first time. These resources are geared towards those organizations that aren't familiar with single audits. And if you are a firm that doesn't perform single audits, but you happen to have clients that are going to have to undergo a single audit, these are resources that you can share with them. And while you won't be able to perform the single audit, it is a way to prove that you have a trusted client advisor relationship and you are concerned with their well being as a whole. Another, oh, if we could go back, please. We have another uh, practice aid related to another coronavirus package, which is the coronavirus state and local fiscal Refo recovery funds program, CSLFRF. Um, again, a lot of uh, organizations for the first time were receiving federal funds. And with this program specifically, there was an alternative compliance exa examination engagement designed. So this would be a little less rigorous than a full single audit, but would still allow Treasury to review the use of the funds. Um, just a couple of quick notes. The Federal Audit Clearinghouse is now accepting 2022 single audit submissions. There was a delay as they were waiting for a form to be updated, but that is final. There is um, some review of single audit submission extensions relating to recent weather events. Puerto Rico did receive a six month, six month extension due to Hurricane Fiona, and the GAQC is monitoring any other submission extensions relating to weather as well. And again, high level, resources for those that perform these government audits. We have a new AICPA audit and accounting guide that has been updated for state and local governments. And also there is a GAQC uh, rebroadcast of the annual required update. So anything that the OMB put, put out in their supplemental guidance, um, this will be reviewed and get you up to speed on all the changes that have taken place. And now moving on, I have one more specific area of audits to go through, and I am excited to be joined by Tony Lee Andrews. She is a director of ethics at the AICPA, and she will be walking through um, some information about ERISA audits, employee benefit plan audits, talking to us about the Department of Labor, of Labor and how these all tie together. So Tony, do you mind kicking us off with giving us some background on, on what exactly is ERISA? Sure, Carrie. So ERISA, there's another one of those acronyms Carrie mentioned, but that's the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. 
And that's a federal law that sets minimum standards for most voluntarily established retirement and health plans in private industry to provide protection for individuals in these plans. ERISA requires annual audits of plan financial statements by an independent qualified public accountant of plans subject to the provisions of ERISA. And this requirement is generally applicable to plans with 100 or more eligible participants at the beginning of the plan year. The Department of Labor issued an interpretive bulletin in 1975 that provided guidelines for determining when an accountant is independent for purposes of ERISA's annual reporting requirements. So though the retirement plan environment has seen many, many changes in the last 47 years, DOL independence guidance hadn't changed. The AICPA has been advocating for, for many years for the DOL to modernize its independence rules to better reflect the realities of the current plan environment. So if you listen to episode 60 of the Ethically Speaking podcast, that's a podcast um, from the AICPA Professional Ethics Division, you'll hear some, some really interesting stories about this. Great. How prevalent are these ERISA audits, Tony? And, and what's the big news now? Well, each year, as you saw on the previous slide, approximately 86,000 ERISA plans are audited by 4,300 CPA firms. And these include defined contribution plans, meaning uh, 401k, 403b plans, also defined benefit pension plans and health and welfare plans. So in September of this year, the DOL issued revised guidance and this new guidance uh, issued by the Department of Labor was actually issued on Labor Day this year, which was September 6th and uh, fir first updated release since 1975. Great, Tony. It's been almost 50 years since an update was released. Exactly. Can you, uh, can you shed some light on what prompted these updates now? Definitely. The DOL discovered through extensive studies that firms that perform the fewest plan audits have a much higher deficiency rate than firms that perform the largest number of audits. So notice it's not the size of the firm, but the size of their EVP practice that contributes to the deficiency rate. So the DOL wanted to ensure that there are enough qualified auditors available to perform these audits. The changes to the previous time period that I'm going to talk about and office prohibitions make this possible. Great. Can you walk us through what some of these changes are and, and maybe also highlight some things that haven't changed for those that are familiar with, with ERISA audits? So the new guidance is now less restrictive than before, but it certainly still preserves the DOL's ultimate goal of protecting plan participants and beneficiaries. So what are the changes? So first, the time period during which accountants are prohibited from holding financial interests in the plan or plan sponsor. So now all firm employees can dispose of their publicly traded securities before the period of professional engagement, but still have owned them during the period covered by the financial statements. They can do that and still be independent. Now, the DOL defines um, period of professional engagement the same as the AICPA does, and you can find that definition in the Code of Professional Conduct under the definition section. And then the second change is in the definition of office for the purpose of determining who is a member of the firm. Uh, same definition as the AICPA, and you'll see there on the bottom of the slide, episode 26, of ethically speaking is what's an office in a remote work world and that explains that in greater detail. Now what's unchanged? Well we all know um, you, you can't keep plan records and then audit the plan and in talking about the changes before I mentioned publicly traded securities. This does not apply to those securities that are privately held. 
Great. Thank you, Tony. And in maybe 30 seconds or so, can you give us a couple of, of top bullets about what, what the summary is and what everyone needs to know? Okay, quick, 30 second overall summary. Facts and circumstances approach overall. That's, that's again, the approach of the DOL. Don't audit your own work. You can't audit your own work. You can possibly provide multiple services, but that could result in prohibited transactions, so be careful. You can provide actuarial services to the plan or plan sponsor, and you can audit the plan and plan sponsor. So um, again, listen to episode 60 of Ethically Speaking, update to DOL independence guidance is great news for auditors. We want to make sure that we have enough auditors out there to, to audit these plans. And then also be on the lookout for a revised AICPA DOL rules comparison. Employee benefit plan quality center members will get notification through the center and we in the ethics division will send out notification in the AICPA update as well as the CPA letter. Fantastic. So you mentioned a couple of podcast episodes here. What are some other resources that firms can use if they want to dive into these DOL changes? We've got um, resources listed here on the slide. One is the DOL press release. One is notice in the Federal Register. And as always, if you have any independence questions related to these DOL changes or any other independence questions, you can always call our AICPA ethics hotline. Number's right there on the screen, 888-777-7077, option two, then option three. We'd love to answer your questions. Wonderful. Th thank you, Tony, and thank you for taking me uh, in a time time machine back to <laughs> my, my younger days in accounting. Back to the auditing days, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, that, thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Tony. That last slide, I think there might have been a couple of links that were hard to see. We will we'll work on uh, correcting that as we, when we send out uh, the newsletter next week. Bring Mark back uh, with me. So Mark, just as, as you listen to this discussion, I mean, sometimes things happen in one year, sometimes it's over 30 years, but just talk, I mean, I, I know you and Sue, Sue Coffey, Sue Coffey who leads uh, public accounting uh, for the AICPA here, you're, you're actively working together. You've got the technical teams, technical experts like, like Tony, working with your advocacy team as you, as you connect with the DOL on matters like this. So maybe you share some, some comments on you know what's occurred here in, in the process. No, it's um it, it's it's an issue that we raised on town halls. You know, with all of the of the, the money that's flowed through, um, you know, for things like PPP. You know, making sure that we have our arms around that. But I think that the 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 biggest thing credibility that we have because of working with the technical teams, mm -hmm. working with the um, technical committees. Mm -hmm. So that's in market, that's going on in market. And that gives us the ability to have conversations with policymakers where we have a lot of credibility and they want to know how it's going. They want to know how implementation is going. How to improve things. How to improve things if they have to improve things, how things aren't working. And so, and how's it going with your clients? What are your clients saying? So it may not be something that directly impacts the profession, but because of where we sit in the middle of the economy at every level, there's a lot of interest in that. And I will also tell you for the for the town hall community, you know, we we did get the uh, IRS to acknowledge the uh, ERC mills. Part of that was when we were going to Capitol Hill and we, when we were going to the IRS, we were noting that the chat line and the Q&A line on our town halls are being lit up with issues. And that's that's something that we can use that is uh, extremely effective. So um, just so the community knows we we listen and we take that to the policymakers that we hear you. Thanks, Mark. Well, I'm going to jump in here. We've got a lot of uh, questions coming in. Carrie, I'm going to start with you. There's a number of questions related to single audits and what you covered there with the Government Audit Quality Center. I'll just give you three and there might be some you can take and, and some we can address in the newsletter. But here's one just about, is the audit required for receipt of funds of 750,000 or more or expenditure? Maybe a little bit, if, do you have uh, any, any, the PPP um, is, 
if you just own, if you only receive PPP funds, are you are you required to do do this do the single audit? And then just uh, a question about the background, the name of single audit. Okay, this is this is a lot of content in one question, Eric. Yes. Um, so the seven hundred and fifty is receipt. There is an exception. SVOG, the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant, um, is an expenditure. So we've covered that on a previous town hall. Um, so that was a little bit different. Um, so we can maybe cover that again in the future or refer back to um, uh, to that episode or whatever the case may be there. Um, PPP is not subject to single audit, so I just want to throw that out there that no worries there for the federal funds on that portion. And the name single audit, um, I honestly, I don't know that history. I remember calling it A133 audits. Me too. I don't, I don't know if Tony knows. There you knows. go. So we will, <laughs> <laughs> we will, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to you on that. Maybe we'll throw that out. I'm sure we'll get somebody in the town hall attendees will, will give us that answer. Uh, Mark, um, questions about just, you know, with the, the new, the acting commissioner and, you know, maybe more about how he, he's going to maybe change things from what Reddick was doing. What, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I think the first thing he's going to do is he's going to be just like us waiting um, for new members of Congress to get there. And then the, the Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee who have jurisdiction over the IRS and Treasury are definitely going to be having conversations with them. So there's going to be a lot of focus on them, probably more than previous uh, acting commissioners, just because of the intense focus that's going on right now related to the IRS and service. So I think there's going to be there's going to be a lot of focus on him. There's going to be a lot of conversations about reforms going on. There's also going to be, again, you know, highly politicized focus on, you know, the 87,000 um, new IRS agents. But there's also going to be an opportunity for us to be working with him uh, and others in our coalition of tax preparers to talk about things that the IRS can be doing. And so it's a great opportunity for us to be in the middle of that conversation. He's going to be having a lot of it. Um, and he's also got to figure out, I mean, this is one of the challenges for the commissioner. You've got to keep, you know, the IRS employees who are, have been under a lot of pressure. They went through a lot of things in COVID. He's got to keep his agency functioning. At the same time, they've got to modernize it. They've got to figure out how to move to digital from paper. Paper's their kryptonite. Uh, and they got to improve service. Okay, thanks, Mark. Tony, we're kind of in the lightning round here. So you, you, Eric, you did can, a, I, can I yeah. rudely interrupt of and uh, clarify something? Um, so we've got a lot of people talking about single audits. Uh, apparently, everyone knows the answer except me. Um, so it refers to the auditing of multiple federal agencies under one umbrella. And I did want to clarify, I think I did misspeak. It is the, the threshold for a single audit, $750,000 um, that has been expended. I think I said received. So my apologies for misspeaking on that. Um, there was some SVOG specific news to clarify there, but I wanted to make sure that we did not let everyone leave with incorrect information. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. It's a, it's a live show. The questions come in fast, so <laughs> perfectly okay to, to correct and clarify things. Tony, uh, related to uh, the discussion on the ERISA audits, can your firm do an audit if the accountant and the firm provides plan administration functions? You did address that, but maybe just hit that one more time. Sure. So um, one of the, um, what changed Again, I, I just want to reiterate that is that the time period during which accountants um, are prohibited from holding financial interests. So that was the, the part that changed. Um, what you can still do is provide actuarial services to the plan and the plan sponsor, and you can audit the plan and the plan sponsor. Thank you. And more information, as you noted, on that on that podcast and we also highlighted some other other resources that are available so now i just want to kind of move to uh the in summary section and uh highlights of upcoming town halls so thank you carrie and tony for today's uh participation and mark as well so here are the the summary points uh this was absolutely a power hour uh you know kicking things off with that strategy discussion with Simon Bailey, a lot of positive comments are related to that, which I really appreciate. 
and then Mark, the, Mark Peterson's update on what's going on in D.C. with the elections, the IRS, and then Lisa, I mean, Carrie really did a great job covering many, many uh, technical updates. So here's the, the past town hall series links. Please do take advantage of those. And what we're going to have coming up on the next town hall, November 17th, uh, we're going to have Lisa Simpson will be back. Uh, Tom, Tom Hood is going to be having a future of finance discussion. And we're also going to have a firm panel discussion. And it will be you know, touching on a number of tax topics. So it'll be a, a great uh, a, you know, cadre of, of different topics. So hopefully you can join us for that. And following the, the November 17th will be a special edition uh, a town hall on December 6th. That will be a Tuesday. Uh, at 4 p.m. Eastern, and that is going to be coming live from our digital CPA event. So look forward to hosting that event, and that will actually be in Austin, and Simon Bailey and others will be with us in, uh, in Austin at Digital CPA. So that's all for now. Thanks for being with us, and look forward to being with you again in two weeks. And one thing we will be talking about in two weeks are the election results as well, and what that means to many of the things that we're advising you on. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. You can now subscribe to the AICPA Town Hall series on your favorite podcast platform, as well as watch archives on YouTube and AICPA TV. Tune in for live broadcasts Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time.